guests and staff would you please um, push your roll call vote let's hope everything works this evening <laughs> okay Jim Stecker would you confirm please Thank you. All right, we have 20 present and one absent. <clears throat> would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and would you please stand for a moment of prayer for Howard Mesma, who passed away on Sunday. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. A motion to approve the agenda. Motion by Supervisor Baraboo, second by Supervisor Booty. Mm -hmm. Any additions, corrections? No. Please vote your ballot. Jim, there we go. 20 yes, 0 nay, 1 absent. We have a majority vote, so the agenda has been approved. A motion to approve the uh, minutes, and that includes August 20th meeting and the 20, August 6th strategic plan workshop meeting. A motion by Supervisor Dreheim and a second by Supervisor Karth. Are there any corrections or additions to those minutes? If not, please vote your ballot. Twenty yes, zero nay, one absent. We have a majority vote. The minutes have been approved. Are there any petitions? There are no petitions. Communications? We have two? Yep. Okay. First, first communication is a note from State Representative Ron Tussler congratulating Calumet County on the $300,000 EPA Brownfields grant. Okay, please post that on file. And the second communication is a Wapaka County resolution asking for a revision in statutes to make the probate and clerk of court fees consistent. And uh, we refer that to the Protection of Persons and Property Committee. Public participation? <coughs> there is none? Okay. Our special um, business this evening, um, we're going to welcome Greg Brittenacher, our new veteran service officer, and he's going to tell us a little bit about himself. <laughs> Raise this up a little bit. All right, like uh, my name is Greg Brinacher. A uh, little bit of background about me: uh, Air Force veteran, served from 2003 to 2007 uh, in the Air, uh, Air Force. I was stationed in Minot, North Dakota, and bounced around to through England, 
uh, through Europe and then also forward deployed to Iraq from 2006 to 2007. Uh, background for veterans benefits wise, I come from Winnebago County Veterans Service Office uh, where I was trained by uh, people that I admire in, in my profession and that I hold dear um, and collaborate with still. And uh, I look forward to taking those skills that I learned there and implement them here. Uh, there is overall, um, once I get the right processes and procedures in place here, um, we can begin enhancing the services that I continue to provide to our veterans in this county and then going further, expand outreach, um, making sure all, all veterans and surviving spouses um, continue to get their benefits that they deserve. Um, on a different note, um, non my office, but for if you are know of any Korean War Air veterans, uh, honor flights doing a flight to Korea. Um, so I, I can give you some more information on that if that's something that's interested for our Korean War veterans. Um, other than that, if you have any questions, please give me a call and we can talk about it. All right, thanks. Thank you and welcome to Calumet County. Thank you. All right, Mary Carell, our Community Economic Development Director will present the history and overview of the CDBG program. <laughs> Need to come down a little, little bit on that mic. <laughs> So I, I believe that the title of this presentation makes it look like it's going to be dreadfully long and perhaps even a little bit um, tiresome, but I assure you that I will go extremely fast through this. Um, and really the reason, I just want to start out by, by making two primary points. One is the reason for my giving this presentation is because you have some agenda items coming up that need to be approved that really seem like they have nothing or not much to do with economic development. Um, so this presentation gives you a little bit of context for why that's happening. Um, the other point that I want to make um, and ask you to keep in mind is that for all of the efforts that I'm talking about, um, there have been no county general funds used um, through this program. These have all been external funds to the county. So I will start out. There's three main parts to my presentation. First is a very quick overview of the history of the county's revolving loan fund program. As the second part is the transition of our program that we're currently going through. And then the third part is future actions. And again, this will be really fast. So in 2000, the county got an $850,000 um, grant from the state um, to make a loan to Wholesome Dairy through the Community Development Block Grant uh, program. Again, no county funds have been used in this program. Um, the purpose of the program really was to, to provide funding to help start up businesses. So the county used their grant funds to make a loan to businesses. Business paid the loan back. It was a low interest rate. And so that is how the funds began uh, revolving. And it was generally helped for small businesses to provide them with gap financing, um, either as a secondary to a bank loan or as the only source of their bank financing. The finance department, um, Dan DeBonis, the finance director and his staff have administered the program since it started in 2000 um, along with his staff and then there have been economic development staff throughout the years primarily attached to the planning department. And finally there was a revolving loan fund committee some of you served on that committee over the years. So all of the decisions about the loan requests were made by the Revolving Loan Fund Committee that was made up of two county board supervisors and three business members. Between two, um, 2000 and 2015, we made loans to 32 businesses 
Um, the the loans were administered for a total amount of just over five, well just under six million dollars, and some of that came from additional grants from the state or loans directly to businesses that are county um, administered. Uh, we had eight loans that were written off, and three of those 32 original loans are still in repayment. Uh, there were no new loans made after 2015. Uh, so in my entire time in this position, there were no, no new loans made because business bank loans were, were um, very low. So there was basically no interest. So we had this transition that occurred to the county um, to something called the CLOSE program. So CDBG, Community Development Block Grant Funds, uh, there was a CLOSE program. So in June of 2018, our program got an email, as did all of the other revolving loan funds in Wisconsin, that due to a federal audit process, the Wisconsin revolving loan fund program was being closed. And they were developing a new program that was called CDBG Close. That program uh, became effective February 1st of this year, and so we have two years to use the funds. And the way the program works, and that is why I'm speaking to you and why you have these agenda items. We have a one, about a $1.33 $1 million loan balance um, that we have to, we are required to repay to the state Wisconsin Department of Administration and then we can apply for our money back to use as grants. And we also have some loans that are still in the accounts receivable, and we are able to use those funds locally. They're something called defederalized, which means they don't have to apply to, uh, or they don't have to follow federal criteria. So we're working through the transition to this new CLOSE program. So what we are going to be doing, staff is applying for, we're preparing an application to apply for our community development block grant funds. So up to the $1.33 million. We have hired Cedar Corporation to start that process to apply for our first grant, and that is going to be an economic development planning grant in the, um, to the amount of about $75,000. And then we'll be creating a microloan program. So the, the resolutions that you will be passing tonight are prerequisites to apply for the funding. If we don't have those resolutions in place, we are not able to apply for the funding. So they aren't resolutions that necessarily have anything to do with economic development. Um, there's a, a resolution against anti uh, against not properly dislocating people from their homes. There's a non-excessive force of use resolution, and then there's a resolution authorizing you to apply for the grant. So not, again, necessarily economic development resolutions, but required um, at, to apply for the grant funds. That's all I have. If there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Supervisor Diedrich had a question, oh, Mary. Sorry. I'm sorry. Thank oh, you, Madam Chair. Mary, real quick, uh, assuming this goes along according to your plan, how long does the county have to recoup those funds? Two years. Two years. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, then moving on, um, Dina Mooney, county planner, will present information on farmland preservation. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Dina Mooney. I'm the county planner. I don't get before this um, body too often, so thank you for having me tonight. I wanted to provide a brief summary regarding our farmland preservation plan. You know, these plans are so much fun to read, and so what I wanted to do was to kind of highlight some of the key takeaways that I found as um, I was writing this plan. So. And I also have with me tonight Matt Payette, so if there's any questions at the end, we can certainly answer them. 
So why do we do this farmland preservation tax, or excuse me, farmland preservation plan? Well, basically it's because of tax credits. With the plan, um, residents are potentially eligible uh, to get tax credits. And the amounts vary depending on certain criteria. So if you're in an ag enterprise area, you can get a $5 an acre tax credit. If you're um, just zoned exclusive ag, you can get a $7.50 tax credit. And then if you're in both, you can get up to $10 a, um, an acre tax credit. There are certain requirements though in order to receive the tax credit and those are soil and water um, conservation standards that need to be met. These plans are nothing new to Calumet County. This is in fact our fifth plan. Um, we've had one in 1980, 1988, um, excuse me, this is our fourth plan, 2010, which is still in effect and then now we'll have our fourth plan which will get us through 2030. We did receive a farmland preservation plan grant from DATCAP. Um, when we created the plan back in 2010, we did it without any grant funding, which made us eligible this time around to get some assistance. Uh, we were awarded, awarded around $22,000, and um, which is 50% of the total costs that we incur. Uh, we are required to have the plan done by the end of this year. Since we had the grant money, we were able to do some additional studies, and this included hiring the Survey Research Center at UW-River Falls. With the funding, we were able to survey farmers in the area and our, our um, mailing list included 446 residents, and this included farms that had an egg assessment of 50,000 or more and were assessed agricultural. Uh, UW River Falls was actually really nervous when we gave them the list of, or the number of surveys that we wanted to mail out. Usually when they do these types of surveys, they can be in the thousands or so. And since we were under 500, they didn't think that we would be really successful at getting an appropriate return rate to get the statistics that we needed with the survey. Um, we ended up having an awesome return rate of 61%, which far exceeded anyone's expectations, and we're really glad that the farming community in the county um, felt it was important to get their voices heard regarding this topic. With this survey, the number one thing that we wanted to find out was whether or not there was support for farmland preservation and ultimately farmland preservation zoning. And in fact, we did find out that there is support for this program. UW-River Falls also analyzed um, the survey results and there were three themes that they identified. And the concerns that we heard most often from our farm farmers were the low price for egg commodities and high cost of land, making producers pessimistic about long-term sustainability of egg in the county. And um, I'll talk about that a little bit later on in the presentation. They had mixed feelings about government intervention, and they had concern about ongoing consolidation of farms and its impact on smaller farms and the environment. We really wanted to be thorough on our public participation. Um, so in addition to the farmland preservation study, which was done in January of 2018, we had public informational meetings as well. Um, we mailed postcards to property owners similar to the um, farmers FPP study. Um, those meetings were held in May and we did those twice. We did one in the evening and we did one during the day so we could try to um, accommodate everybody's schedules. And then we also had a public hearing back in July. Um, at these meetings, we really didn't get any um, alarming uh, comments, and the plan was presented at this, at this time, so they did have something to look at and react to. In the plan, there are certain items that you need to include, and the number one is the goal and objectives, and we have only one goal. 
which is to maintain the operational efficiency and productivity of the county's agricultural areas for current and future generations. This is the same goal as our 2010 plan and the same um, main agricultural goal as in our comprehensive plan. So we're not changing anything. We're staying the course. Um, we do have a variety of objectives. Um, we want to reduce the rate of prime farmland being converted to non-ag development, allow for the opportunity to accommodate creative and unique forms of ag, focus new areas of growth within or near existing farms um, that or near existing areas of development where adequate public facilities and services exist in our plan for expansion. But you can see the whole list in your plan. And these are the same as in our um, comp plan in our previous plan as well. So these are the interesting facts that caught my eye as I was going through the plan or creating it. Um, from 2016 to 2018, um, we were the second fastest growing county in the state, and in 2015, we were the third fastest. Um, one thing, another item that we have to talk about is municipal expansion. One um, significant item that happened from our last plan to this current plan is the incorporation of the town of Harrison to the village of Harrison. Um, they are not identified in our farmland preservation plan because they are a village and we have excluded all lands um, that are incorporated, excluded all lands that are incorporated. Um, our population is projected to grow by 31% um, between 2010 and 2040. The towns of Brothertown, Charlestown, Rantoul, and Woodville all expect to lose population during this time. However, every single town is gonna see an increase in households. Overall, Calumet County is going to see a 44.5% increase in households, while Wisconsin is going to see about 22% increase in households. So you can see how this impacts farmland. Um, another item of the plan that we are required to discuss um, is economic growth and business development. Um, I used data from 2014 where UW Extension created a value and economic impact of Ag Report. And the economy is pretty strong here in Calumet County. I'm sure everybody is aware of that. 1.5 billion in economic activity. That's 37% of the county's total economy. It creates over 4,000 jobs and it adds 318 million to the county's total income or 23%. It also generates just a little over 19 million in taxes. Egg processing is our largest industry. And um, because I handle the tourism, I wanted to include some data regarding um, the economic impact of tourism. And since 2012 to 2018, we saw a $14 million increase in tourism spending in the county. And a lot of that can be attributed back to our egg tourism businesses. When it comes to environmental preservation, I really wanted to highlight our nutrient management. Since that is a requirement in order to get the tax credits, they do have to have these plans in place. So in 2010, when our last plan started, we had rough, roughly 40,000 acres with a nutrient management plan. And you compare that to 2018, where we had over 88,000, so more than doubled that amount. And here's what that looks like. So you can kind of see the increase from 2010 to 2018. Um, one of the most significant things that we look at is to see how successful we were with our plan last year, or excuse me, last time. And we wanna see how much land had come out of egg production. So when we did this, we looked at land use data that we got from East Central um, Regional Planning Commission. Um, they did it for us in 2004 and in 2015. Um, according to that data, we lost 1.8% of our egg land, which when you think of it, considering the development that I first mentioned at the beginning of my presentation is quite significant, or isn't quite as significant as you think it would be. And it, it gets back to our, our policies and procedures that we have in place um, to make sure that land that has been identified for preservation is preserved. 
Um, one piece of data that is takes, plays a huge part in the plan is the census of agriculture. And you can see in this chart, um, it's probably actually very hard to see because it's pretty small. Um, you can see the red line or orange line on top represents the number of farms in the county starting in 1890 and it goes all the way to 2016. So you can see how the number of farms has decreased but that line below it, that blue line below, is showing um, the number of the size of the farm and you can see that that number is increasing as the number of farms is decreasing. And then the bottom chart is the amount of land that we have in agriculture here in the county. This chart is actually really shocking when you compare it to how things are in the state. Um, you can see in Calumet County, which is the blue line, how high we are in comparison to the state when it comes to ag land without buildings. Um, it's about 14,000 an acre in Calumet County as opposed to about 5,000 an acre across the state. The numbers are a little bit more even when it comes to ag land without or with buildings, um, but you can still see how Calumet County is surpasses state numbers. Livestock. Um, I'm, nobody, this isn't a huge shock, but the number of farms, since the number of farms is decreasing, obviously the number of farms with livestock is decreasing except when it comes to beef cows. Um, and then beef and milk cow, milk cow numbers, are the only numbers that we're seeing an increase of. We do have to identify what we feel are the changes that we're going to see in agriculture. Um, one of the changes is the loss of small scale farms due to high land values and increased competition, um, innovation and cooperation between government and farms to prevent environmental degradation as more is being asked of the land since farms are getting um, they need to have, uh, with the cost of farm land, you need to have high yields, which is putting more inputs into the land. So we want to make sure we have a good balance um, when it comes to environmental protections. Um, we'll also tend to see an increase in niche ag on less desirable land, and we're going to have a new um, county zoning ordinance, hopefully, that piggybacks off of this plan. We also plan to see an increase in tech and ag. So how do we plan to do this? Well, we plan to do this with comprehensive planning, farmland preservation zoning, which is where they get the actual tax credit, ag enterprise areas, which we have one, and that's a tax credit as well. We do this through a land division ordinance, which um, has a density provision that limits the number of homes on ag land. Um, and then we have a purchase of conservation easements program. Um, we have it, but there is no funding for it. So what, what does this really mean? And I guess what it's done for us in the past 10 years is nearly $2, um, $2 million in tax credits has been issued in Calumet County. Um, and that's only between tax years 2011-2017. The town of Brilliant actually has the highest amount of tax credits, the highest number of acres claimed, and the highest number of claim, claims made. One problem is that the tax credit amount has remained unchanged since 2009. However, um, farm land prices continue to increase as well as um, inputs that need to be made. When we did this study, we found out that people generally felt that the tax credit was reasonable, though. In the AEA, um, farmers are required to sign a 15-year contract. 
There are um, currently 15 property owners that have signed this contract for about 3,500 acres out of a possible 28,000. And so we feel that that tax credit um, is probably too low for people to actually sign their name to that contract. So that's one thing we'd like to see get changed with the state. Um, what did we determine? How did we determine farmland preservation areas? Basically, if they're zoned agriculture, um, so all the way from exclusive ag, even down to our small estate residential, we still consider that an ag um, district. In the town of Stockbridge, where there is no zoning, we looked at their comprehensive plan, and the rural character areas are the ones that are included on the farmland pres maps, and this is consistent with our 2010 um, plan. And we also wanted to make sure that if you were claiming tax credits, you're still going to be able to um, get your tax credits. What's excluded? The incorporated areas, um, transition areas, public lands, already developed subdivisions, and then the non-AG zoning districts. Any questions? to speak. Patrick? Thank you. Uh, your numbers on the loss of ag land, 1.8 percent, is that what you stated? Yep. For what period of time? That is from 2004 to 2015. I have numbers that are drastically much higher than that. I don't have them along, but I will share them with you. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Supervisor Stillman. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> when uh, uh, a, a, a farmer gets these, this uh, money as a tax credit, does that cr tax credit has to be classified as income to him then also? Or does it just come off the, off the county's tax roll and, and it's done, right? Or how does that work? Um, I guess as far as how the tax credit program it's Self works. I haven't really had a lot of experience with it, but it sounds like it is coming off their income. Okay, so then then they would have to pay income tax on that seven fifty or or ten dollars an acre credit in the end. Do you think? I don't know. No. I can find out for you, but I don't know. No. I don't know if you know Matt or Tony. Do you guys know? I <coughs> Mr. Stillman, I'll try to answer your question. I, you know, I don't believe it comes off income and they're not taxed at it. It's just a credit at the time that their taxes are prepared for that given year. So they would get a $7.50 $7 credit for every acre that they have under ownership that is in the program they would get a credit for that. So it's, I don't think it would be taxed as income, it would just be you know, a tax credit. Yeah. Per okay, se. okay, so then the county would get less money because of that credit to the landowner then, right? No, as I understand, that's use value assessment, so the assessment on the property would be different than this tax credit. So it does, wouldn't impact the county's bottom line when it comes to levy. Okay, okay, that's what I wanted to know. I think what they told me that uh, uh, when when, when uh, like a landowner was in a government program and he got money from the, the like the federal government, they they would have to classify that as income on like their W two form. That's what they told me years ago. That uh, um, and I think I went to meetings and and you know like uh, some people like they don't want to get into these programs. I said don't make them uh, don't make them classify that as income. And, and, and then maybe they would be more apt to get into the program because it, because they give money, they get money from the government, well then they gotta give what, 25% back. You know, that, uh, that's, that's kind of a blow in the butt or something really that uh, I think anyways. Uh. Supervisor Dreheim. Thank you, Madam Chairman. When we started this whole farmland preservation years and years ago, uh, there was a clause in there that said if you had tax credit and uh, you sold 10 acres out of that, that you had to pay back all the tax money for, la for 10 years. And then they started 
passing this stuff that you don't have to. So how are we preserving anything if you can just get out of it and still keep that tax money that you had all this time that you had and, and uh, now here you, s you are and, and you sell land off of it and, and there's no, no penalty. Mm -hmm. There should be a penalty if you get out of it. You're trying to save land. Well, if you get out of it, well, then you should pay it back. That's not fair. And that's why I, I don't like the Farmland Preservation Act anymore. I liked it at the beginning because if you got out of it, you got a penalty, but you don't anymore. So thank you. All right. Supervisor Diedrich. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, the tax credit is a Wisconsin state tax credit or it's a federal tax credit? It's a state. So it's a state program. And I kind of agree with the previous supervisor's comments about um, the ability to get, quote, out of it, if you want to talk about it, and then sell the land. Because clearly, with the price of land in Carolina County and, and the town of Harrison becoming a village, it's clear that the economics of the land value is overriding our attempt to keep land as ag. I'd also like to add one small comment. Um, the figures you showed, the percent of farmland lost, 1.8%. Points 1.8 1, 1 percentage points on a base of 64 percent. That's about 2.8 percent actual uh, acreage lost. So it's actually higher if you look at the acres than if you just look at the percentage points. Um, yeah, I I appreciate your presentation. It made me smarter about this. I just wish there would be a way we could get this to work <laughs> for the county. Thank you. All right, Supervisor Lachran. Uh, to add to what Kenny stated, the use value, not use value, but the, uh, the uh, zoning used to be that if you took uh, 10 acres out of a 40-acre parcel, you paid back the tax on the 40 acres total you, and, you know, and, and the penalty on the 10. You, did, you just didn't pay back on the, the 10, there was a penalty. Folks, the thing we're really missing a boat on and is the use value business. We're getting lost over and over and over again. $10,000 acre market price paying taxes of $2 and a half an acre. Is that right? And then the investors are buying it and sitting on it. They're paying zero, about the same two and a half, three bucks an acre. And if you live in a township like I do, where 75% uh, uh, of the land basically are, are close as agricultural, you don't need those guys invested in. You think they're not investing? There's two homes going up in, in, in a half a mile from where I live in what was number one ag land. I don't care if it's one acre, one house per acre or whatever. That's okay if they want to do it. But prior to that, let them pay the tax that they deserve to pay. Thank you. Supervisor Lachey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a couple of questions in regard to a clarification on the hmm? number of acres of farmland that's available. You indicated in your report that uh, you did not include, include any farmland for the village of Harrison, and I'm assuming because they didn't, uh, you don't have an agreement with them. But I think that that, that doesn't ref really do a good job of reflecting how much farmland is available in Calumet County. The other question I have is in regards to that, what do you do in the case of a township electing to uh, opt out of uh, uh, county zoning. Could you answer those questions for me? Um, if a county were to, or excuse me, if a town were to opt out of county zoning, um, then the, what the plan does is the plan makes um, the residents eligible and the only way they can get the tax credit is either through developing an AEA or having exclusive egg zoning so if the town decides to get out of exclusive egg zoning then those residents can't claim that tax credit okay so that's a choice that would be made by the individual uh, townships are there any yep. townships uh, currently uh, in the in, in the county that have done that um that anybody has gotten out of exclusive egg zoning? Yes, in townships. No. 
there's been a couple towns that have decided to do their own exclusive ag zoning. Um, but since 2010, Um, and then as far as the question regarding farmland, um, we did the, the numbers are for the whole county. Um, so Harrison should be included in that number. Okay, then I was, what I heard wasn't really what it, it, they are, but you indicated that they weren't. They're just not included in the, farmland prez plan so a farmer in village of harrison because they aren't in our farmland prez plan they aren't eligible to get tax credit i'm glad you made that that, that clarification because it doesn't really you know why would you exclude them when they're you know we don't know what's going to the future is going to bring. I mean, yes. we could have a, a lot of land yet left in, so in farmland, per, you know, farmland, and it could go to exclusive, and it is exclusive ag, and, and could go to the farmland preservation if, uh, if they so choose. If to. they wanted to, like, if a, if somebody from um, Village of Harrison is interested in doing a tax credit, um, we would just amend. We'd have to amend our plan, and then the village would have to also have exclusive ag zoning or else there would need to be that egg enterprise area. So there's a couple other things that would that need would to be, be in same play. Same thing would be true for any town that would yep. exempt out of, of co county zoning. Yeah, then they wouldn't get the tax credit. It would only be eligible, th eligible through an AEA. Thank you. Okay, if there are any other questions, please vote your ballot. Oh, this we don't just, have a vote. That's Excuse later me, in the we agenda. We just discussed it. We're getting there. Excuse <laughs> me. Other. I'm way ahead. Right. Okay. Thank you, Dina. Uh, we'll discuss the CAP team meeting on October 29th in Madison. Um, for you people who are on the CAP team, you should have received a, um, a registration blank. And that needs to be in two Jess by D September 27th. If it's not in, you don't go. Um, you need to contact her with that registration so she can make a room for you. I am not aware at this time what's going to be on the program for the CAP at this time. So just so you know, September 27th, mark it on your calendar. All right, well, moving on to resolutions. Resolution 2019-24, resolution requesting the Wisconsin Legislature to end the use of personal conviction waivers for school and daycare center immunizations introduced by the Health and Human Services Board. Right. Do I have a motion to adopt? Motion by Supervisor Booty, second by Supervisor uh, Karth. And uh, Supervisor Schwallenberg, would you speak to this resolution? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as of May 1st, 2019, Wisconsin is one of 18 states that allows parents to exempt their children from vaccination for personal reasons. I might have that wrong because on my other notes, I've got one of 16. So since May, two other states must, might have, must have gone that way too. Um, other states only allow exemptions for medical or religious waivers. Uh, the number of personal conviction waivers is rising in the state, and Wisconsin is above the national average for allows, allowing children to opt out. Uh, the vaccination rates protect those who are too young or cannot be vaccinated due to medical reasons. As you may have been aware, in the last year, we have had an outbreak of measles in this country. Mumps is becoming another problem and they're saying whooping cough is too. So um, this was brought to us by our public health nurses and I ask your approval. Are there any questions on this resolution? Supervisor Stillman. Thank you. Um, can, uh, can, can a doctor opt them out of, uh, out of their uh, immunizations if uh, if there's a health problem with the child that they that they that they shouldn't have this this 
vaccination Absolutely. for some reason? or Absolutely. Medical and religious waivers will still stay in place. Okay. It's the personal one that I just don't want my child to have a vaccination. It might hurt them. Some people think that uh, vaccination causes some diseases yeah. which they've disproved yeah. or other things. Those oh. two reasons will still stay. Okay, that's good. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Dreheim. We answered? Okay. Yes, thank you. All right, there are no other questions. Please vote your ballot. We have 19 yes, one nay, one absent. So we have a majority vote and that resolution has been adopted. Moving on to resolution 2019-25. Resolution adopting a residential anti-displacement and relocation assistance plan for community development block grant programs introduced by the Administrative Services Committee. By motion by S Supervisor Karth and a second by Supervisor Booty and Supervisor Gintz, would you speak to this resolution? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as Mary Correll had indicated uh, earlier as she gave the presentation, there's a new process that is in place now uh, through the Wisconsin Department of Administration. And one of the things that's a requirement there is that the county board uh, adopt this resolution, uh, resi uh, making sure that uh, residential anti-displacement and relocation assistance plan is in place just purely to protect the people who might find themselves in an area that might be covered by a, a request for funds uh, to do something with that area and um, and so it's it's part of the process the new process thank you questions Please vote your ballot. We have 20 yes, zero nay, one absent. We received a majority vote, so that resolution has been adopted. Moving on to resolution 2019-26. Resolution adopting a policy to prohibit the use of excessive force in the barring of entrances exit for nonviolent civil rights demonstrations introduced by the Administrative Services Committee. I have a motion by Supervisor Schwal Steer and a second by Supervisor Booty. And Supervisor Gens, would you address this resolution? Thank you again. And again, this is part of the requirement uh, for the dispersal of money through the community development block grant uh, funding process and uh, assures that peaceful demonstrations are allowable. You have to keep your facilities open uh, for that to occur. And uh, so we just need to make assurance for at the county board level that we will do that. Thank you. Questions? All right, all in favor say aye, or um, push your ballots. <laughs> 20 yes, zero nay, one absent. We have a majority vote, so that resolution has been adopted. Moving on to re resolution 2018-27. Resolution authorizing <coughs> submission of a community development block grant application introduced, introduced by the Administrative Services Committee. All right, I have a motion by Supervisor Steer and a second by Supervisor Schwallenberg. And Supervisor Gens, would you please yes. address this? Th thank you. Now we are, with this resolution, uh, authorizing the submission of a community development block grant application uh, for to uh, work on our <coughs> economic development plan. And also this resolution uh, 
would give the authority to the county administrator to sign all the documents that are required uh, on behalf of the county. Thank you. Any questions regarding this? Please vote your ballot. Supervisor Stecker, would you confirm? Thank you. 20 yes, zero nay, one absent. Received the majority vote, so that resolution has been adopted. Now moving on to ordinances. Ordinance 2019-2. Ordinance to adopt the Calumet County Farmland Preservation Plan 2020 through 2030. Introduced by the Planning, Zoning, and Farmland Preservation Committee. All right. Is there a motion to adopt? I have a motion by Supervisor Diedrich and a second by Supervisor Karth. And Supervisor Huffberger, would you address this ordinance? Thank you, Madam Chair. In addition to the synopsis that Dina gave us, I would like to add that this 70-page uh, document is a guidance document that establishes a vision for ag preservation, ag development, and development of ag-related businesses. It identifies and establishes policies and implementation items designed to protect farmland for future generations. It is certified by DAPCAP, DATCAP, which you hear a lot, that's the Department of Ag, under Chapter 91 for a period of 10 years. The committee and staff so far, we've done a lot to get to this point in 2018. We had a project kickoff meeting a detailed farmer survey that Dina mentioned to us and a plan developed by staff. In 2019, we had public information meetings, committee review of the draft plan, a public hearing, DATCAP, once again, Department of Agriculture, review and certification, planning, zoning, and farmland preservation committee recommendation to the board on September 5. Adopting a plan tonight will allow Calumet County to do three things. <coughs> Continue to participate in the farmland preservation program, which allows eligible residents annual farmland preservation tax credits. Formally adopt the plan as guidance document to help establish policies to protect farmland now and into the future and formally adopt a plan that is consistent with the Calumet County comprehensive plan and Calumet County general zoning ordinance. The planning and zoning and farmland preservation committee requests your approval of this ordinance. Thank you Supervisor Huffstick. Are there any questions? If not please vote your ballot. Supervisor Stuffel would you confirm? We have 19 yes, one no, one absent, a majority vote, so that ordinance has been adopted. Moving on to ordinance 2019-2. It's actually number three. It should be three, <laughs> excuse me, there's an error here. All right. <coughs> ordinance to repeal and recreate chapter 82 zoning of the Calumet County Code of Ordinances introduced by the Planning, Zoning, and Farmland Preservation Committee. I have a motion to adopt. I have a motion by Supervisor Karth and a second by Supervisor Kleckner. And Supervisor Hustberg, would you re address this ordinance? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. General Zoning Ordinance Overview. The current ordinance is being repealed and recreated as identified in Wisconsin statutes because of, of numerous changes. The ordinance is an implementation <laughs> tool for the goals and objectives outlined in the County Farmland Preservation and Comprehensive Plan. It revises the base farm track system currently in use to utilize a rezone process rather than conditional use permits for non-farm residents. This will provide a system much easier to track and it's much more efficient for staff. The ordinance takes in numerous changes to state laws and recent state and federal court cases involving zoning issues. It is certified by DATCAP, once again the Department of Agriculture, under Chapter 91 for a period of 10 years. 
The committee and staff in 2018 held meetings with all towns under county zoning, had a detailed farmer survey as part of the project. Dina talked about that, University of Wisconsin River Falls, and an internal ordinance drafted by the staff. In 2019, we had public information meetings, committee review of draft ordinance, public hearing, uh, Department of Ag review and certification, and on September 5, the Planning and Zoning Committee made a recommendation of the ordinance to go to the county board. Adopting the ordinance tonight will implement the Calumet County Farmland Preservation Plan that reflects changes in rural and agricultural land use over the last decade, simplifies zoning administration for staff and, and customers, and responds to recent staff and federal zoning changes. It formally adopts the ordinance that is consistent with the Calumet County Comprehensive Plan. The Planning and Zoning and Farmland Preservation Committee requests your approval of this ordinance. Thank you, Supervisor Huffsberger. Are there any questions? Uh, Supervisor Diedrich. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, believe it or not, um, Madam Chair, I did a read through this document and um, I guess it's a compliment to our system of committees uh, and the work we do here in the county because uh, it's quite a, uh, a bit of information to go through and, and lay out, particularly where you're going to throw out the old and bring in a new. So I would just ask uh, the committee uh, if they're comfortable that all the nuances that accumulated over the years were properly treated in the new uh, chapter 82. By that I mean um, at times when things come up we, we modify or tweak an ordinance mm -hmm. over the years. So when you when you take one and say okay we're going to repeal it and, and recreate it, I just want to have some confidence that those nuances were picked up in the new chapter 82, ma'am. All right. Did you care to address that, Dan? Yeah. I would. Um, I hope so. We have worked on it a lot. It is a large document. We have went over this for hours and hours and hours for the past two years. I don't doubt there's something out there that we missed because things are changing every day. I think we have done, I think we've done as complete a job as can possibly be done. Did we get it all? Probably not. But I'm very confident at the point where we are right now. And Matt, would you like to address further? Yeah, Ron, I understand your concern and, and very much we were concerned with that. We, we had 28 staff meetings in well over 40 hours with Ted Roloff, who had over 30 years experience, Brian Gable, who's got about 15, I have about 20, and Dina's got another 15. So we had about, I don't know, 75 years of experience. And we went page through page. And for me, I didn't have the history in Calumet County, per se, as Ted and Brian and Dina. They have more tenure. So they saw a lot of those little nuances. So we were page by page just to do a lot of what ifs. OK, what, what works here and what hasn't? And what, what can we change here to make this process better? So I feel confident that we have a, a very much a better and easier administer, administratable ordinance in front of the county board here for action tonight. And, and I think, as Mike said, I think we're going to miss in here, you know, on 145 pages and all this work, we're going we're gonna to come back next year and probably do some tweaks, some fixes, but, but I'm very confident that um, with staff expertise, we, we got it right. We're very close to right. All right. Thank you, Matt. Madam Chair, I was, I was simply uh, asking for the reconfirmation if or affirmation, if you would, because normally when we have changes like this, we see the document with changes in red and things crossed out and, and we're dealing with one item or two items at a time. So when you do a, a, a wholesale, I just needed that confidence builder. Thank you, Matt. Supervisor Huffberger, did you have any more to add? I did not. All right. Then we have Supervisor Dreheim. So we just did, the f you did the farmland preservation and now you need this to recreate 
zoning for the farmland preservation? No. I hear farmland preservation come up in this. And we both documents get certified by DAPCAT for for a for a length of ten years. Our, actually, I sh I'll take that back. The plan certified for 10 years. Our zoning ordinance is certified for one year longer than the certification for the farmland preservation plan. So even with our plan update, we can still use our old ordinance. Our old Chapter 82 is still in force. And actually, I'll just add that that ordinance will be in force until the town readopts this new ordinance. So we have meetings set up to meet with every town under county zoning. but. As far as farmland preservation, we plan for it in the plan, and then we have an implementation item within the zoning ordinance to achieve that. Um, we can implement with our old ordinance or new ordinance in the interim. So what I don't like about the farmland preservation doesn't really affect what's going on with this one, or does it? What, what you referred to as the tax credits before, yeah. previously? Um, no, it's going to be same with the new ordinance. The process that's dictated by DADCAP, the state of Wisconsin, the new ordinance or the oral ordinance, that process and repayment of tax credits is up to the state. So it's going to be the same with either one. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Supervisor Gleckner. And Matt just briefly touched on this, but um, the reason for the restructuring of the ordinance was to make it a little easier. Things were regrouped and put in more logical format so that it made it easier for the citizens who are applying for something to find things together and also for the staff to ad to administer it. It's just more efficient the way it's been reorganized. Thank you. And you know I would add one thing to that. We at, under Act 55 we pulled Shoreland zoning out of the ordinance and that left gaping holes that and it was intertwined <coughs> within the ordinance it wasn't just one section so when we had we pulled all that out and created a standalone or ordinance chapter 52 about a year and a half ago that left holes in our ordinance that we didn't really have a choice but do it to really do a rewrap on this okay there are no other questions please vote your ballot oh, hold on. Made a one moment please I was going to ask a question if I could, that's all. Sorry. We're already mm -hmm. voting. <clears throat> 20 yes, zero nay, one absent. The ordinance has been adopted. Moving on to ordinance 2019-4. Ordinance to repeal and recreate Chapter 6, Animals of the Calumet County Code of Ordinances, introduced by the Protection of Persons and Property Committee. I have a motion by Supervisor Booty, second by Supervisor Steer. And Supervisor Steer, would you address this ordinance? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, this uh, ordinance repeals the Chapter 6 Animals and recreates Chapter 6 Animal control ordinance uh, this addresses more of to have a humane control officer trained so they can address the animal problems in the county any other questions I'm sure the sheriff can answer thank you supervisor booty thank you um, on page 13 of the PDF document we have section 16.5 it appears there is a text or perhaps a table missing from this section. Um, is that correct? Or what's the deal? What was that section again? 16.5. Page 13 of the PDF document. Yeah. Is it missing? There's nothing on this one. 
Our court counsel will address that, Supervisor Booty. <laughs> Matt, what's the page that you're referring to? Page number? Um, it is page 13, which is also number 13 of the PDF document. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, with charts, sometimes they don't transfer well, so I can have this resent out. Um, I'll ha ask, ask Lisa to resend this out tomorrow to include that. It didn't change from what I understand. Um, right, what the existing shelter was. If you give me a minute, I can pull that up too. Can you read what's um, missing? We don't need it. Right Do you have the big book of ordinances? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm pulling it up. Okay. I've got it. I've got it here. Matt, would could you, re Matt, would you uh, repeat what's missing there? What was your concern? Um, well, I don't know what's missing because it's not there. Um, but it looks as though there is some text or a table or chart that should be there due to the semicolon. Um, our corp council is checking on that right now. Then we'll let you know where it's supposed to be and what is supposed to be in that chapter. Would it be easier for me just to move to delay this till the next meeting? Sure. Sure. I move that um, we uh, delay action on this ordinance until next month's meeting. Then. All right. Right. I have a mo um, just a minute. We have to change it up here. Can you put your motion in now? Thank you. Is there a second? We have a second by Supervisor Lachey to postpone this until the next meeting. Are there any questions? And please vote your ballot. Hold on, there's a question. Wait. We have a question by Supervisor Diedrich. Yes, Madam Chair. Just curious if delaying the vote on this until November is going to cause harm to the uh, department in any way? There's no, it's not time sensitive, is it? No. It is not time sensitive. All right. Thank you. All right. Please vote your ballot. Supervisor Draheim, confirm, please. And Supervisor Stillman, no. 19 yes, one no, one absent. We had received a majority vote, and that will be placed on uh, the November um, board agenda. All right, moving on to supervisor reports. All right, I have Supervisor Schwallenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for parks, uh, the official opening of our um, 
our phase one of our mountain bike trail will be in October. We I spoke about this at the last meeting. People are already using it. Uh, Adam has been putting, trying to put signs up so people stay on the, the actual course. Um, there was an archeological study needed to be done on our north property before we could put the trail to join, I believe it's Ferry Springs to County Park. Uh, and they found a piece of pottery, one piece. <laughs> So it has to go through the hoops and the final we're waiting for uh, the tribes have got to write off on it. The same thing with our brother town harbor. We're still waiting for the native tribes to, to write it off. Um, uh, we believe we do have a camp host. Uh, so we're proceeding with putting the, the pad in and the, the pad will be placed across um, from the uh, office building right now. Um, for health, our immunization area was, um, oh, I can't even read, excuse me, read my own, uh, was reviewed and we passed, other than they need to put more bottles of water in the refrigerator <laughs> <laughs> to keep it cool, the, the serum cool. Uh, I uh, was on a conference call this afternoon with NACO, uh, the central region. Uh, the federal government is asking NACO to endorse the National Trade Program with Canada, the USMCA, um, free trade agreement. Uh, the final passage of that is unclear right now because both the House and the Senate have got to approve it. There was a question from somebody that because it's a treaty, only the Senate has to approve, but they're saying this one has to be approved by both houses. Uh, right as of now, NACO has no standing because NACO, uh, one of the legislative uh, things on the legislative agenda is they do not support tariffs. Is, uh, so it's kind of difficult to approve a trade agreement if you're supporting, not supporting the tariffs. So they said that will be discussed at the legislative <laughs> meeting in March, whether anybody wants to, to change that. But usually the counties don't get involved. The county organizations don't get involved in the federal government, but this was a request. Thank you. Supervisor Lockram. Thank you. I'm going to give you a little update on a uh, project I've been working on. How we're going to uh, update and better our way of treating or testing groundwater. No, mo no more of the little bottles, I hope. Uh, fortunately enough, I was able to meet with a manufacturer of uh, water products last two weeks ago, Wednesday. They're in. Uh, right south of uh, Madison, about 50 miles, Evansville. They have three plants throughout the United States. And my idea I presented to them was that we do set up a, a meter type system which would be right behind the pressure tank. And you'd be able to uh, read your water at all times, your pressure and anything that would you, you would need. It would be based on the theory would be the same as you test blood, you'd get your blood pulled in and doctor's office or wherever and in seconds they can tell you 40 50 different things that are in your blood what levels they are and whatever so this is going to go I am quite sure it is uh, and I, I was very lucky the engineer that came out that I spoke to and explained my ideas to happened to be from brilliant and Zeber is his name and uh, I used to play basketball against his grandpa, so that helped a little bit. We, we had a little little in. <laughs> but it's the engineer that I left there uh, with this, uh, the, the en their engineering company will take it to the other manufacturers that are in their, their NACO group, like we have, uh, we have the uh, counties association, whatever. But that particular company wants to do something to help sell their water products. They, they bought a company out of uh, Pennsylvania. It's called Campbell, but it's a, it's a uh, subsidiary of uh, Baker Manufacturing. They make the, uh, they have all of these mechanisms and stuff. They're, they're close to what I brought them in to, to, to think about. So I think we have a chance of doing that. And I, it would make me happy. <laughs> make a lot of people happy. You'd have this information instantly, you know, and you could have it, read it out to the DNR, to whoever wanted it. But it's a, uh, 
a big step in getting that engineering done, you know, so we'll need some computer people and everything else that goes with it, plus money. So, uh, but the money will come. I have some pretty good people that will support my idea at this point, but I would never at look for a, uh, a uh, patent on it. For this reason, the manufacturer would have a hell of a lot better chance of getting a money and a patent than I would, but there would be some agreement. So thanks very much for listening, folks. Thank you, Supervisor Loughran. Um, just a couple things for update. The people who are going to the county con conference, you received an envelope with all your information in there. Please take that with you. You will have to show that tax exempt sheet when you register. So be sure you have that with you. Um, I was told that by Jess. Also on September 30th and October 1st, if needed, the uh, Administrative Services Committee will be meeting with the budget. We will be going over the budget and all supervisors certainly are very, um, are invited to attend uh, that meeting. You can ask a lot of questions and uh, Hopefully we can get through that budget in one day. If not, we will extend it to October 1st. And that meeting is at 8.30. So um, please put that on your calendar. Supervisor Huffberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, during part of our, the second half of our Land and Water Conservation Committee meeting this month, County Conservation, as Tony took us out and showed us some of the stuff that he has, that he and his staff has been doing this past year and for years and years before that. I think it was very informative, very educational, very good for us, in my opinion, and I think the rest of the committee will agree with that. We got to see some stuff that we've been talking about, spending money on, planning, and working towards. Frankly, I hope we get to do that again sometime. And I hope we get to invite all of you to come see the, some of the stuff that we are doing that I think is quite worthwhile and interesting and educational. Thank, Thank you. you, Supervisor Huffsberger. There are no other um, um, reports. Um, you have the county administrator's report. Is there any <coughs> questions for Super? For none? All right, we have a appointment to the Heart of the Valley Metropolitan Sewer District and the uh, administrator is uh, suggesting the appointment of Patrick Hennessy to the Heart of the Valley Sewage with a term to expire October 1st, 2024. I have a motion by Supervisor Booty and a second by Supervisor Dreheim to confirm this um, appointment. Would you please vote your ballot? We have 20 yes, zero nay, one absent. Uh, so that appointment has been confirmed. Our next regular meeting, now note this will be November 4th. It, and that'll be our annual meeting at 8.30 in the morning. And I declare this session adjourned. Thank you for your, your uh, attendance this evening and uh, your good work. Drive safely. Don't forget. Don't you get